The conventional wisdom about San Diego's convention center has long been that it needs to expand, but now that idea is being challenged. Scores of businesses and the city itself face millions in fines if they don't stop fouling San Diego's stormwater system. And cab companies cry foul as the city council proposal challenges the lucrative black market in taxi permits. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome. It's Friday, September 26th. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Taryn Mento, Metro reporter for KPBS News, reporter Leo Castaneda of our partner iNewsource, and KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. Well, it's been a given for many years now. San Diego's downtown convention center needs to expand or it may lose lucrative conventions to other cities. The price tag to expand is about $500 million, and since a judge recently shot down the city's hotel tax funding scheme, there's no new proposal about paying for it. And now a new report begs the question, do we need a convention center expansion at all? Taryn, let's start with that report. It was issued this week. Uh, give, us, give us the high points. First of all, who, who did that report? Right. It was put together by the San Diego Tourism Authority, and it was an update to a city council committee about the Tourism Authority's contract with the city. They're, they're responsible for booking long-term business at the convention center, so conventions 18 months uh, and out. Okay. And there were a lot of moving parts to that report, but one of the interesting you know, things you found was it wasn't really space that a lot of uh, folks decided not to bring their conventions here. It was cost. Right. So um, there was 57 conventions that were listed in this report that didn't, for some reason or another, decide to come have their convention here. And this was over a long period of time. They right. planned these years in ahead. 2026, long I believe. Right. So, and the number one reason was cost, mainly high hotel rates. Um, some groups did mention convention fees, uh, having it at the facility in and of itself. Twelve of them said that it was, they didn't get their preferred dates, which tour, um, expansion supporters have said shows that we do need to expand it because if you've got people who can't get the same dates because they're conflicting, if you've had an expansion, two could go at the same time. Two of the smaller or right. medium-sized ones could go at the right. same time, not the big mega Comic-Con type conventions. All right, we do have a clip. Uh, Joe Terzi of the San Diego Tourism Authority that uh, issued the report. Let's hear what he has to say. There's a, a misunderstanding of the report. This is a report that we do annually that tries to uh, tabulate uh, people that we talk about coming to San Diego, and if they don't materialize into a, a definite booking, we try to determine why they're not here. So this report says about 19 of those individuals um, couldn't get into San Diego because space wasn't available or we didn't have their appropriate date. So th there's a little bit of misperception about the price of San Diego and that's not necessarily the most most uh, 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 highest reason why people aren't in the community. A lot of it has to do with lack of uh, availability and space to meet their needs. All right, and that was on the KPBS Evening Edition. Now, uh, Taryn, is, is, uh, is that right? Are we confused about what this report's saying? Well, if you look at the report, that 19 number where I think he's getting is adding up the 12 that couldn't come here because of their preferred dates, and then seven is space issues, as listed at the top of the report. But if you examine those seven, only two of them specifically said convention center space was a problem. The other five referred to hotel space, meaning they couldn't get hotel rooms or hotel meeting space. So if you had the 12 and that two up, that's 14. That's still fewer than the 16 that chose not to come here because of costs. Okay. Now, and it does. Get, baseball, yeah, so it does, but you, you I mean, you, you think that a report is, is just that. It's a report, it's a summary, and it kind of says what it says here. So you're, you're wondering if, uh, if they're coming back and, and um, you know, trying to emphasize this or, or spin that. Right, and I mean, the preferred, they made a point to say that if you add up the hotel rooms that would be lost based on the 16 due to cost or the others due to preferred dates. More hotel rooms nights were lost due to um, convention center space and not having preferred dates than cost. So that's one thing that they are citing, and they did bring that up in the round in the midday interview. Okay, let's hear from Steve Johnson of the convention center, and he also took issue with the report, or rather, uh, some of the the media's interpretation of it. 
I think it's a reason, but I don't, I don't think it's the most important reason. If you look at the numbers, and what numbers we look at in this report are the number of hotel room nights that an event would use. And when you look at that, we have three times as many hotel room nights lost because of space and dates than you do from cost. So clearly, space and dates are a much more important issue for us to solve than the cost factor in San Diego. Okay, again, these are folks who want to see the expansion and maybe have never really been questioned very hard about uh, do we really need an expansion here. Right, right, and he, he just said three times as many were lost. My numbers are closer to two times as many. Um, we've been working to sit down and go over this. Um, it's something that I've been asked the Tourism Authority for quite some time, and it just uh, it hasn't worked out yet, so we're hoping to reschedule to go over this in detail so we can settle that. So you gave them a lot of opportunities then. Uh, yeah. Before the story came out. <laughs> A, a, a few, I'll okay. say a few. All right, Megan? I mean, it seems like this is sort of the story we've been hearing all along, and they're just kind of trying to, to toe that line. I mean, we've heard a lot of that from Todd Gloria, and right? And, and two mayors now, too. Right, and that was kind of what started this story in the beginning was, well, you know, in 2009, a task force said, you know, and, and a lot of city leaders said, we'll lose business if we don't have an expansion. Well, it's more than five years later, so I was checking to see what business have we lost. And that's kind of how I got to this report. Now, this report is just for fiscal year 14, meaning any of the conventions they tried to book during that year. So going back, you could kind of check more and the... Mm -hmm. And Joe Terzi and Steve Jetson did point to letters from organizations that have said that, you know, without an expansion, we can't come back. But again, it's kind of that gray area. We would have to reevaluate if we came back. Now, in your story this week, you talked to an expert, nationally known expert, on a book on, uh, on this. Uh, tell us who he is and what his book is and what he told us. Right. Uh, Haywood Sanders, he's a professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and he did a book called Convention Center Follies where he reviewed a lot of consultant projections, what they said, what room nights or more attendance we would get or cities would get if they expanded their convention center. And he found in a lot, especially in some of the bigger cities, that the after effects fell short of those projections. Didn't mean to say that they didn't see an increase, but it fell far short of what was projected would come. Okay, so it's questionable, at least from this expert looking at, at other cities and the national picture here, of whether these things pen uh, pencil out. And of course, we've seen that with baseball stadiums and football stadiums as well that are publicly financed or at least partially publicly financed. And do they really pay out over time? Leo? Yeah, it seems like why why do you think that city leaders, because, you know, bigger expansion, bigger convention center means more conventions, bigger stadium means more revenue from cities. So why do you think they're sticking to this kind of very simplistic analysis of these projects? You know, I mean, like, that's a really good question. And I know that during the city council committee, Joe Terzi actually said that he's got facts and he's got figures that will show that um, these projections, what we will get in return. And that's part of one of the things that we're hoping to sit down and learn more about what is, what are they specifically looking at? It's kind of seems that a lot of the evidence is um, anecdotal and piecemeal. There's definitely those letters that show um, that the people definitely want to come back, but space is an issue. So it's really kind of let's sit down and look at some hard numbers and let's see where we're at now. All right, a few seconds left on this segment. Uh, remind us about the funding plan was shot down by the court. We don't really have anything in place to raise this half billion dollars, right, that we would need for this expansion. Right, so it was an increase on the tourism tax and Basically, the judge said, well, you didn't ask all San Diegans to vote on that increase. Had to only, go to a vote of the people. Right, only hotel owners. So right. now the city does have a couple of options. They can put the funding plan before the voters, which I think would have to be until... Two-third majority. Yeah. Right, and it would, it, which is a big... A big hurdle, yeah. Kind of tough to hit, but also it would be, wouldn't be for another two years. They could come up with a new funding plan. They could come up with a, a different design. They could scrap it. They've got a lot of options, and I think everyone's kind of talking about it now and figuring out what's the best way to go what, next. What plan B might be. Right. Well, we'll certainly be watching and following up on that story. Well, it is going to rain again someday, hopefully soon, and when it does, all sorts of toxic stuff is going to run off into the ocean and the bay. San Diego has rules requiring businesses and developers to filter storm runoff from their properties, but they aren't being enforced. And one of the biggest scoff laws in, is the city itself, which could be fined millions. Uh, Leo, start by telling us what are these folks supposed to do when it rains and rains hard to make sure that we don't get all this gunk running out to the ocean. Right, so when it rains or even, you know, when you're going through a drought, when people water their lawn and some of that water runs off into the streets, it's 
goes in, down into the drains, and it's those drains you see on the sidewalks with the spray down signs that say no dumping. This goes straight to the ocean. Those kind of big blocky ones we see yep. that when it rains hard, the water yeah, rushes exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. So um, those are supposed to have filters right at the drain that will take out not just trash, but some of the sediment, oils, some of the stuff that you just collect in the streets. The heavy gunk. It's a heavy gunk that uh, will eventually make its way out into the ocean. Obviously, it's awful for the fish, but also. If you're a surfer and you go out right after it rains and then you get home not feeling great, that's all that runoff that you uh, just swallowed. So they're supposed to filter that. So if you have a new development, if the city itself mm -hmm. is building something, uh, there are, are rules in place where you've got to put these filtering systems in. That's right. You have to apply to the city the way you apply for all sorts of permits when you're building something. And you have to tell the city this is exactly how we're going to filter water at this site, once it once it's open, this is where all our um, drains and filters are going to be, and then the city's supposed to go out and actually hold you accountable to that, and that's where a lot of the issues came. Is inspectors from the regional water board, the water quality board, went out there, and they're those the filters, ones who blew the whistle on this. Exactly, thing, yeah. they're the ones that took the city to task, and they went out into these developments and found that those filters weren't where they were supposed to be. They were either missing, they weren't good enough. Um, there's just a lot of problems with them. Uh, uh, Taryn? Well, who's responsible for making sure that those filters are there? Well, that's kind of where part of the problem comes. It's split up between the city's transportation and stormwater department, as well as the public works department, and um, the developmental services department. So that's where some of the issues came is, uh, they were sending out inspectors that weren't perfectly trained, or they were overlapping on a lot of the work. Uh, so it's it's a little bit more organized now. It's, they've centralized the process so that the people going out to inspect these sites actually know they're the ones that are responsible and they have the training to do it. Now, when you get a, a permit to develop and build mm -hmm. something, or the city itself has to uh, go through the same process when it's building something, right. a park, let's say that it's developing and buildings at a park. Uh, it's pretty clear in there that these systems have to be in place and you'd think they'd be inspected along with the electrical and the plumbing and the walls and the roof and everything else that inspectors look at. Well, that's exactly the problem is they sent out inspectors, but they weren't you know, stormwater inspectors, which aren't um, in ample supply. They were sending out uh, developmental services landscape inspectors that hadn't been trained to look for these stormwaters. So, you know, if I send you out to a development um, and ask you to take a look and make sure this is fine, if you have no idea what you're looking at, you're not going to catch an issue. Right. And what are some of the major developments we're talking about here that you cited in your story? Um, everything from mostly apartment complexes, a lot of churches, um, even the Ravies Children's Hospital was on the list of developments that were missing inserts. Anything that's you know really big is going to need a lot of uh, these um, filters. And it wasn't just private companies and private mm -hmm. developments. It, as we said at the outset, it's the city itself, right? That's right. Several, and that's where uh, the, the water board actually got really upset with the city is. All, the city got this notice in 2010 and they started getting all the private developments up to code, but they didn't do anything to actually fix the city-owned projects. Um, so a lot of parks, um, a new police academy building is on that list. Mm. So a lot of city-owned developments they weren't doing anything about. And parks you think you'd be concerned about because of the fertilizer and, and runoff and, and irrigation, et cetera. That's Megan? Right. What sort of, how difficult is it going to be for these um, these buildings and, and private property owners to kind of remedy this, the situation? For the most part, it won't be hard at all. It's, again, going in there and just installing, like, a filter. It's just a box um, that goes right in the drain. So it shouldn't take too long. Some of them might require an actual uh, permit because it's such a big modification, and they get allowances in terms of how much time they have to fix it. Would they have to go back and tear up some construction in some instances, um, or they might redo have to? Some things? Yeah, if um, especially when it comes to parks, for example, you need to redesign some of that, so that might require some new permits. Um, and there's a consequence to this. Um, tell us about the time frame and then the fines that are, are looming if this stuff doesn't get taken yeah, care so of. Yeah, so the city has two years to basically get it all fixed. Um, they, they got a $1 million fine, just about $1 million, and that's split into two. Half of it goes into the state account to clean up issues like this, and half of it will be forgiven by the water board if the city takes care of these private projects. 
and does what they call the enhanced compliance actions, which is basically just extra homework that the city's going to do to kind of make up for not having done all this stuff ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And this isn't a new problem. I mean, as you mentioned, surfers, swimmers, anybody who's been in San Diego any amount of time, if it rains, uh, we always say, don't go near the water, don't right. go near the water. And this, you know, this enforcement action comes to with a change of philosophy. Uh, the, the original thought process when it came to rain in San Diego was get it out as soon as we can, make sure, you know, Mission Valley's not flooding, make sure that um, the freeways aren't full, full of water. So um, pump it out, get it out, move get it water, out, exactly. head it out to sea as quickly as possible. And, you know, eventually we realized that that's maybe not the greatest thing to do with water and the oceans. So the, the Water Quality Board has really been cracking down the last few years on making sure that these new filters that are starting to be required are actually in place to make sure we're not uh, filling the water with trash. Megan? Do any of you have any idea what it's like in other cities? I was born and raised in San Diego, so to me, this, you know, don't go in the water, don't go surfing is just, this is what happens, but you it know, seems, you know, that's a you good know, question. it's 2014. And I was born and raised in Michigan, of course, right in the middle of the Great Lakes, and you don't hear this sort of thing uh, there because I think it rains more regularly. I wonder if this isn't a function of our long, dry summer months where the gunk builds up on the roads, things build up, there's not all that much runoff from irrigation, and all of a sudden we get a fairly decent storm and everything runs uh, in. It's just the infrequency of the rain, I wonder. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you look at the freeways, for something that we don't think about is every time you hit the brakes, a little bit of copper falls off your brakes. And if you take mm -hmm. all the cars in the freeway over, you know, six months without rain, millions and millions. All, all that copper eventually goes down into the ocean all, all of a sudden because, again, right. it doesn't rain that often. Right, but these filters hopefully would catch some of that stuff and it's, get some that's, of that that's gunk a dream. out before it starts uh, <laughs> running down in there. All right, well, we'll keep uh, watching that and see as these deadlines approach uh, what they do and if they can't take care of that problem. Well, for taxi cab drivers, a city-issued permit is more precious than gold. Permits allow cabbies to operate but the number available in San Diego has been capped at 993. That's made for a robust black market here where cabbies have, been, have paid well over $100,000 for a taxi medallion. But all that could change soon. Uh, Megas, tell us what the proposal is to, uh, to change the uh, number of these permits. Sure. So the city's public safety committee passed a proposal last week that would basically uh, remove a cap on the number of permits for taxis in the city. So right now we say that there can't be any more than 993 taxis operating in the city. Uh, this proposal would lift that and essentially open the market. Um, the cap is there, arguably, to make sure that the market isn't oversaturated. Um, and so this would just allow anybody who is, would be qualified to drive to get into the game. So it sounds like simple supply and demand. You you uh, stop the supply, the demand's going to go up, and that's why we've seen this. And we'll get into a minute on how much uh, folks are paying uh, for these things and what they're saying. But the, the highlight here, I want to play this clip. Uh, the uh, highlight of this meeting the other day was uh, permit owners in the, the city. And let's hear what this taxi driver has to say. I work hard, I invest, and I'm here now. So now you're taking the business from me. I don't think I appreciate that. So it's not fair. Please think twice. It's a permit. It's not a stock. It's not a bond. It's not a piece of property. In fact, the permit is owned by the, the city. Okay, and that second voice, of course, was uh, City Attorney uh, Goldsmith saying, uh, hey, folks, uh, we don't care what the black mark and how much you paid for this thing. Um, you know, we're going to change the game here. Yeah, I mean, this was pretty a pretty stunning meeting to watch in the fact that it was pretty merciless. I mean, that's not to say that one side is more of a victim than the other, but this was four hours of public comment with the majority cab owners, um, cab owner operators or those who have large companies um, saying that if you lift this cap, all of my investments are going to dry up, but I'm going to end up on the streets. And then, you know, cue Jan Goldsmith, and he's essentially saying, like, yeah, sorry, man. Um, <laughs> and, you know, then you, you know, fast forward to the end of the meeting after four hours of people pouring their hearts out, and it was basically like a quick kind of emotionless vote uh, where they said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to forward this to city council. I'll do a little, yeah, housekeeping. This was a council committee meeting, and this is going to be aired again before the full city council. And, of course, we'll likely see some more fireworks and anger in that meeting.
Right, yeah, it has to go to full city council, it has to get the mayor's approval, and I believe it also would need to be approved by the Metropolitan Transit System, which uh, the city has hired to regulate the taxi industry. Do we know where Mayor Faulkner stands uh, on this particular issue, or do we? Um, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody about it, but my guess is that it wouldn't be a slam dunk. I think there would be a lot of conversations. A lot of conversation. Okay, Taryn? Yeah, I just wanted to go back. I mean, I saw some shirts they were wearing that said, I took out a mortgage and a 401k to purchase this. How much does it cost to get a medallion? I mean, how is it supposed to be and what really yeah. is it? So the way that the market is now, people are essentially paying what you would pay for a house in the Midwest. Um, we've heard reports of up to $140,000 for one of these permits. Uh, you heard Jan Goldsmith say, however, that this is, this is not property. This is a permit. Um, um, the way that it's supposed to work is that if you, if your friend wants to get into the taxi business and wants to have your permit, uh, or you want to pass it off to your son, you go to MTS and you pay a $3,000 transfer fee and nobody makes any money on the back end. But what's happening is that behind closed doors, this transaction is happening um, that we've heard goes up to $140,000. How did it get so out of hand? How did this market get so huge? You know, I don't know who was the first one to say, you know, let's let's make some money off of this. But um, in 1984, they capped the the taxi market. It used to be open, which is what they're proposing to do now. Um, and you know, once you cap something, it's a supply and demand right, sort of thing, and it, the value increases. So over um, 30 years, this thing has just ballooned to this. Yeah, and um, the taxi cab uh, association, the driver association, they're saying this is all because of lax oversight. You guys just turned a blind eye to it for you know 30 years um, and and so that's sort of how they're saying it it manifests got to this problem so Marty Emerald is the councilwoman pushing this so uh, why does she say what's her explanation for that why is it needed so last year a study came out um, and we started to hear that drivers were really kind of working in poor conditions um, because it costs a lot to own and operate a taxi cab and a lot of that cost has to do with this high cost of these permits. Just to get in, get yeah. your foot in the door, yeah. Yeah, um, the drivers are leasing the ability to drive this cab that's permitted and that lease is pretty high. And so at the end of the day, after you've made all of your fares, you've paid for gas, you've paid for lease, um, drivers are saying that they're not even taking home $5 an hour. And so Working these long, long, tough hours mm -hmm. and not making much at all after everything. Yeah, and so um, Councilwoman Marty Emerald, um, you know, has talked a lot. She said she talked with them for four years trying to figure out a solution, and the solution uh, seems to be the free market in her eyes, which I think is pretty stunning. Um, you know, in most cities, when they talk about a taxi cap, um, it's the drivers who support it because they want to make sure that the market isn't oversaturated, that they're going to be able to take home a decent amount of money at the end of the day. Um, you also traditionally hear that labor and Democrats sort of want to have some checks on the free market to make sure that people are protected. And here, this taxi market has just been turned on its head, and you have the drivers, you have a Democratic councilwoman, and you have the taxi association, which is backed by the labor council, that want an open market, that want a free market. So seems to be the opposite of what you would see have seen. Yeah, in the past. so I yeah. think that shows you how sort of um, exploited this this industry has been. And, and Milwaukee had a similar situation and uh, some legal action resulted there, right? Yeah, Milwaukee this year voted to uh, lift their cap and open the market, just like San Diego, um, some like Councilwoman Marty Emerald wants to do. Um, taxi owners uh, were very upset because, again, they're, they're going to lose a lot of money. And so they took Milwaukee to court, um, alleging that this was a taking of property and that they didn't Pay they have this thing of value, and the city's mm -hmm. action caused them to lose the value. Yeah, and the court sided with Milwaukee, and uh -huh. so Jan Goldsmith thinks that the city of San Diego is perfectly within its right so to that's, open that's this. That's a precedent. If we lifted this cap and we had these these many permits now, what would be the impact, and what would be impact on consumers and people who who hire taxis? Um, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of the taxi cab companies and cab uh, permit holders are saying that this is going to oversaturate the market, that there are going to be so many people competing for your dollar that everyone's going to be taking home pennies, um, and that it's going to work as a disadvantage to drivers. Um, 
when you look at, but, but people also say that this is going to improve competition. It's going to improve customer service. It's going to allow people to innovate, uh, to compete with the Ubers and the Lyfts. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the reasons people like Uber is because the drivers are really nice and cordial and I think what you'll see is that um, you know cab drivers now are under a lot of stress they have to make this lease and so if you get in their cab and you're like I just want to go three miles of course you're gonna get some attitude um, if they have their own permit they're not worried about it then um, customer service in the cab industry is going to improve mm -hmm. Taryn, did you have a question? I, was, I mean, I was going to ask, so it would completely eliminate the problem then, at least with this. I mean, it would, it would certainly probably create some new problems. Um, the, the black market, though, would, would go away. This yeah. big cost of a permit would yeah, go away. Yeah, absolutely. And there would still be lease drivers. Um, the, they're proposing that you have driven a taxi for five years before you can get your own permit. So there will still be people who want to get into the industry um, who would need to lease. Um, All right, we got a few seconds left. Uh, what's the timetable for the city council then to take this up and, and decide on this? It hasn't been determined yet. They're um, they're crafting an amendment to their taxi cab policy, and then once that's ready, they'll forward it to city council. Very good. All right, we'll be watching for more stories on that. Well, that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, KPBS. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Taryn Mento, a KPBS uh, uh, Metro reporter. I knew source reporter Leo Castaneda and Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. A reminder, all the stories that we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.